I want to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Central. Normally, this would be our summer series. You look at the schedule and it says no guest speaker. That's me. Next week, we'll be back to our regular scheduled speaker. Second order of business, despite what you might think, I did not leave the mints on the pews. That's a service project that the kids did to thank all of us for letting them have a VBS and all involved in that. So you can feel free to have one. There's actually a few thank you letters kind of strewn around if you want to do that too. If you want to look at those, really nice notes they signed for all of us. Uh, I didn't know what to speak on tonight. Jim said, you want to speak? And I had to think about it. I talked to Donna, my wife, she's teaching the preschool. So one of the parables they're doing is the prodigal son. So I decided I would do the lost parables. And you've probably gone through these before. I know even from this pulpit they've been taught. But who should have sympathy for is Brother Charles, because he's heard this three times in the last week. But he did tell me he rarely remembers what I've said. So it'll be fresh if he comes back in here from taking pictures. So before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity we have gathered here to study your word. We pray that you be with our VBS, Heavenly Father, that much good might come from it, that seeds would be planted in these young children's hearts, and that much good might come from it, that you might give an increase in them. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all the blessings we have in him. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So, if you want to go ahead and be turning to Luke chapter 15, is where we're going to be most of the evening. Uh, of course, you know, Jesus used several methods to teach. He taught the large crowds, like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He would teach one-on-one. -on -one. You think about John 4 and the woman at the well, or John 3 with Nicodemus. He would sometimes go to the synagogues and teach. But what he did a lot of time, that's what we're going to talk about, few of these not are parables and you've heard you know parable is what a he an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and of course most anybody even non-religious people can think of at least a few you think of the good samaritan that's become part of our vernacular you think of hospitals there was a hospital next to where i went to college in lexington called the good samaritan there's good samaritan laws that allows you know someone who helps somebody in trouble to not get sued over that. You just call in general. Somebody helps somebody in need is what? A good Samaritan. And you think of one of them we're going to talk about tonight, which is the prodigal son. You see a lot of stories, plays, everything that involve the plot of a person leaving their family to go to what they think is going to be something better. And it turns out to be pretty bad. The one I think of is ever read the lion the witch and the wardrobe there's a young man that does that very thing but what i'm going to start with are what i call the lost parables it doesn't mean that they've been lost and found it's about three parables about losing something and of course they're much more than stories there's a lot of spiritual meaning to them so let's set the scene for these Let's go to Luke 15, and I'm going to read the first two verses of that so we can set the scene for where we're at. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, and that's Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. All right, first you got the tax collectors, sometimes called the publicans. They were not thought of highly in those times. You know, people are about as thrilled with paying taxes then as they are now. I'm having a lot of fun with the Kentucky Department of Revenue right now, and I don't think very much of our tax system even now. But the problem with these guys is, one, they were Jews that worked for the Roman government. So the Jews saw them as like traitors. Uh, some of them were dishonest. They'd skim money off. They'd tell Brian he owed 100 whatever to the government. He might only owe 50. Well, they'd take that 50 and slide it into their pocket. Now, not all of them were bad. You know, Matthew, he was a tax collector, but he was an apostle. He wrote the book of Matthew. You think of Zacchaeus, who we always think that song the kids sing about the wee little man to climb from the sycamore tree to see Jesus. But it's one of those professions that enough of them are bad that they get a bad reputation. So I'm already behind. There we go. Uh, 
And then you had sinners. And that's a big group of people, but right in this example or in this reading, you're thinking about what the Jews would consider sometimes you hear that the dregs of society, what they considered the people that were beneath them. So then we got the Pharisees. Uh, they were a group of the Jews. They were supposedly the most righteous, the most you know strict obeyers of the law of Moses. They were thought of as the cream of the crop. And then you got the scribes. They were the ones that copied out the law. You know, John mentioned this on Sunday when he talked about Hosea. The printing press wouldn't come on for almost another 1,500 years, so if they wanted copies of the law, somebody had to copy out by hand. If you see my handwriting, you know I'd never made it as a scribe, right? It's terrible. You had a really good handwriting. You had to be very meticulous in writing that out. But you think if you copied something out a bunch, you'd probably learn it, wouldn't you? Well, they would know. In fact, they would do some teaching. If you look in Ezra, Ezra's called the scribe. Uh, so that sets the scene for who we got in, to talk about these parables. But they have a complaint. This man receives or he spends time with sinners and what's worse he eats with them they just thought that was awful what in the world is he doing spending time with these people you know he, they wouldn't call his name this man they won't say jesus you know you think about eating with people you have to have a certain relationship sit down with a meal with somebody you know we have what fellowship meals right so you can learn a lot about a person and have a good relationship by eating a meal with them Pharisees and scribes just thought this was awful. They shouldn't, they shouldn't spend time with these people. It says complain. Some versions say grumbled. Some versions say murmured. It gives you the idea how unhappy they were with Jesus doing this. So instead of, you know, complaining or, excuse me, setting them straight or arguing with them, verse 3 tells us that he's going to speak a parable to them. And he's going to do three parables about losing stuff. Now, you ever lost anything? I'm sure, we all lost something in our life and never found it again. And that's what these parables are about. So we're going to start with the first one about the lost sheep. So I'll start with verse 3 and read through verse 7. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. All right, I don't know if you've ever seen sheep. Josh and I went to Australia a few years ago, and we saw some sheep and some sheep herding and things like that. Well, if you don't keep an eye on sheep, they'll wander off on you. And it starts with a shepherd. You see shepherds a lot in the Bible, both figuratively and literally. Uh, you know, you think of Abraham and Jacob and Jacob's sons, and David is famous for being a shepherd. And John, again, mentioned a few weeks ago, Amos. He wrote the book Amos with a shepherd. Uh, so he here has a hundred sheep, and he loses one of them. And you might think, well, he's got 99 left. Why would you worry about one sheep? Well, that was a valuable thing. You think of what all they used the sheep for back then. You know, they ate its meat, used its wool to make clothes, used its milk to make cheese and, and different things. Uh, they used the, hor the horns of the sheep to make horns and trumpets. Uh, they even used the skin to make tents. If you look in Exodus where it talks about building the temple, they made, not, excuse me, the tabernacle. They made the walls out of dyed ram skins. So it's very important. So he leaves those 99 sheep to go find the one. And it says he goes until he finds it. He doesn't give up. He keeps looking for that sheep until he finds that sheep. I apologize. I ought to do better than that. All right. Notice how much he values that sheep. You don't see him like whack it with his staff. You don't see him like yelling at the sheep like that would do any good, like the sheep would understand him. What does he do? Puts it on his shoulders and carries it back. And I checked the Greek just to make sure this wasn't a lamb. 
It was a mature sheep. According to what I read, a sheep might weigh between 100 pounds and 300 pounds. So I'll give you a comparison. I weighed Lucy the other day, and she weighed 50. And sometimes we like to go out when she comes over, and we get our plastic swords, and we go out in the field, in the forest, and we have adventures. Well, invariably walking back, guess what happens? She's like, reaches up, Granddad, carry me back. And I'm not going to turn that down because I don't know how many more of those I got left before she doesn't want Granddad carrying her anymore. It's not a long walk, but by the time I get her up to the house, I'm ready to put her down because that's a lot, and that's 50 pounds. You know, th he must have really cared about this sheep to have put it up here on his shoulders to carry it. And notice what he does. He calls all his friends, and they rejoice. Now, I don't know if you've ever lost a pet, and then it came back to you, and you're really happy. That's happened to me, but we didn't throw a party when the pet came back for anybody. I don't know if you, maybe you did. We didn't. But that just shows how much he cared for that animal. So the meaning of the parable. The shepherd is who? Jesus. You know, John 10, 14. This is a well-known verse, but we'll turn here and read it. All right. As of, let's see, yeah. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. So Jesus is that sheep. So who are the sheep? Who does that represent, you think? Sinners. Could be us, maybe, right? You know, could be the lost. Could be Christians that have wandered off. You know, we wander away, right? We get distracted by something or somebody. Or the cares of the world pull us away. Or maybe we have some great disappointment or tragedy. Or, you know, even the enticement of sins. The allurement of sin can pull us away. But just as that shepherd showed concern for that lost sheep, so does Christ and God for his followers when they wander away. And then they're restored to him. And they never give up on them. You know, do we ever give up on people? Sometimes, yeah, we shouldn't. But sometimes we do. But we should have this same attitude toward people. You know, when they fall away, we should, you know, go looking for them. We should lovingly receive them back. Again, you notice that shepherd, even though I'd have been tempted, maybe if I'd have searched all night and I was hungry and finally found that sheep, you might have grabbed it by the piece of that shepherd's crook and yanked him back. But it doesn't say he does that. So in my mind, that shows the attitude we ought to have, a loving attitude to taking that person back. Now, what's important, though, is what verse 7 says there. All right. It says, there will be more joy in heaven or one sinner who repents. Now, that's a key thing to see there. They have to repent, which means, of course, they're going to turn away from that sin. It's Part of it's being sorry, but sometimes people think, well, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry about what the consequences to me. It's a lot more than that. It's like you're going to resolve either not to do that thing anymore or if there's something you ought to be doing, you're going to resolve to do, excuse me, do that. That's repentance. I even looked up the Greek word, and I'm going to butcher this, but it's metanoio, which means thinking after. That means after you've done it, you're going to think about what you've done long and hard to make sure you don't do it again or you do the thing you need to do. It might involve some kind of sacrifice in your life. Maybe you've got to not go somewhere you really like to go your whole life, but you know you can't go there anymore. Or you might even have to give up some friends that you used to hang out with because they try to take you to places you, or make you do things you don't want. So that imp it's important to notice, and we'll see this later too, that repentance is involved. And finally, you got the 99 who didn't wander away, and that's these Pharisees, right, who got on him for his association with those sinful people. Uh, he's telling them the importance of that one person, that one sinner. But the irony here is, guess what? The Pharisees, excuse me, needed Jesus just as much as those sinners. They were sinners too. They didn't want to admit to that. They just wanted to look down on those other people. And again, we don't want to be like those 99, do we? 
You don't want to look down on anybody. You know, we're told that God is no respecter of persons. And we shouldn't be either. All right, let's go to the next one. I'll try to stay on these slides a little better. The lost coin, which is 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You ever lost money? I mean, just lost it out of your pocket. You know, there's a hole in your pocket and that money's gone. Once in our household, I think when I took the finance class, I told you I'd get out our budget meeting every two weeks. Well, one week, for some reason, I got out a couple days early. I put it somewhere, and guess what? I forgot where I put it. And those are a couple of tense days in the Yancey household, I can tell you. You know, I wanted to blame everybody. It was my fault. Found it. You know, you do that retracing your steps thing. Finally found it. Josh, my younger son, later said, Dad, I prayed you'd find that money. And it was a good lesson there. See, so your prayer worked. But this woman had lost a silver coin, one of ten. Now, some places I read that that's some sort of heirloom a woman might have. And some say it's maybe the budget money she had. But whatever, that coin was super important because it says what? She swept the house. She, lied a, she lit a lamp. You know, she didn't have a flashlight. Like we do, you know, we even have flashlights on our phones now. She didn't have all that. But again, she searches carefully until she finds it. And again, when she finds that money, what happens? They rejoice. We found that budget money, but y'all probably realize we didn't invite y'all to a party when we found it. You know, I needed that money to feed two growing boys, actually. But anyway, uh, so let's talk about again. What is it? We got to figure out what it means. The woman is Jesus again, looking for that money. Coins are the lost. You know, those coins, they don't have any, we got to find them. Now, uh, what always strikes me in this, well, let me hold off on that. No, I'll go ahead. Verse 10, where it says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And when I've taught this before, I just can't, express how amazing I think that is. When a sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice over that? I just can't wrap my head around that. You know, you think of earlier in Luke, Luke 2, or when Jesus was born, the shepherds saw the angels rejoicing. And they rejoice when a sinner repents and comes back. But again, you got to be that repentance. You just can't come back and do whatever you want and live whatever life you want. You gotta be willing to repent of whatever it is you're doing that you shouldn't be, or start doing what you ought to be doing. And another interesting take I saw on this parable, and you can tell me what you think. I was reading uh, Burton Kaufman's commentary, and he mentioned that the coin is the only thing in these three parables that's an animate object. Coins don't lose themselves. You know, I like to think that budget money just walked off on its own and it wasn't my fault, but I lost it. So the point he made, and you can think about this, that could represent a congregation. And we're supposed to watch out for each other. And if we see one of us starting to go lose ourselves, then we need to help ourselves, each other. Make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, if you think about it, what's the most valuable thing we possess? What do you think? Our soul. That's right. You know. Mark 8, 36 and 37 tells us that. That it's the most valuable thing. You know, you can have all the money. You can have all the prestige. You can have all the power. You can have all the pleasure that you want. But it's not going to, you know, it's not going to do any good in eternity. Or what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? I think of another parable of, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, the rich man had everything in his life. Lazarus was just hoping he could get the crumbs off that guy's table. But when they died and that rich man's in torment and he's looking up Lazarus in Abraham's bosom and he just wants Lazarus to touch his tongue with a little bit of water. 
And the rich man's told, you had your good things when you were alive, but now you're in torment because, you know, you didn't, you had a sinful lifestyle. No matter how, if you have decades of everything being wonderful, if you're lost in hell over it, it ain't going to make any difference. No matter how wonderful it is, you know, there's nothing in this life worth having that's going to cause you to lose your soul. I don't care what it is. You know, I always think of a story a guy told me, you know, see these guys in jail and they're marking off, you know, lines on a side of a cell that they're going to get out in 50 years. In hell, you're not going to do that. There's no, you know, you have 10,000 of them each and once a year. Well, it, it lasts forever. So even if you had 80 years and you had everything a human would want, it's not going to be any good if you lose your soul over it. And also, I think, again, these parables point out we've got to seek the lost. We don't wait for that sheep to come wandering back to us. We don't hope that coin turns up maybe one day. I'd be walking around, oh, there's that coin I lost a week ago. And, you know, in this congregation, Adam will talk about evangelism. We have the evangelism center, but we need to make use of that. And I'm talking to myself as much as I am anybody. But, again, we've got to look for the lost and not expect them to wander up to us. All right, now let's talk about what probably is one of the two most well-known parables in all the scripture. But hopefully, I can find some stuff in here that you know will help us when we go over it. Luke 15, 11 through 14. All right. Then he said, "A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and began to be in want. So he got two sons, brothers. The younger of them goes to his dad and said, Dad, give me the portion of goods that falls to me, my inheritance. Now, when do you usually get an inheritance? Yeah, it's got to die, right? Well, he was allowed to get his inheritance now. I remember Adam teaching on this. He said he either felt like his dad was about to die or in their relationship he was as good as dead to him anyway. So it says he divided to them his livelihood, split up the inheritance. So it says the son gathered all together and went to a far country. How many of y'all, when you were younger, thought, man, I can't? Wait, get away from my parents. Man, I can go, I can stay up as late as I want. I can eat whatever I want. I can hang out with whoever I want. I had that. You know, that's just something a lot of young people want to do. And we're going to see later how much he's going to miss being home. But, you know, that adulting thing, as they call it nowadays, is not easy. You know, you find out, you know, that laundry doesn't magically appear clean in your drawer like you might have thought it did. or those good meals just don't show up on your table like the days when you're living at home. And there's these bills that you didn't realize you had to pay for electricity, and gas, and cable, and all those kind of trash pickup and all kinds of things. And you ain't got to pay for a place to live. Well, probably none of that occurred to him until he left and went out on his own. Uh, it says he had prodigal living. Prodigal means wasteful. Some say riotous, some say wasteful. Uh, he spent it all on probably frivolous things, probably hanging out with other people on parties, you know. When you have money to spend, you usually have plenty of all the friends you want, don't you? Now, I've found this verse from Proverbs, and I don't know if I have glossed over this verse for years, but it almost describes perfectly what I'm talking about. If you'll turn to Proverbs 19. Verse... Four, I think that's what it was. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friends. So everybody loves somebody that's got money to spend on them. When that, we'll see in a minute. When that money's gone, things change a lot, don't they? All right. So he spent all his money. You think about how long it probably took that daddy to make all that money. And the son probably would have been better staying there because you think even from a financial standpoint, which is something I'm interested in this, 
it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger if he waited. He could have stayed at home and had the comfortable life he had and gotten it later. But he's blown all this money, and then you notice suddenly he starts having problems, doesn't he? Uh, his money's gone, and what happens almost right when the money goes away, what occurs? What? A famine. Now, famine, I don't think any of us have probably ever lived through a famine. We might have gotten a glimpse of it when COVID first started, and there were certain things that you couldn't get for any sum of money. Now, a lot of toilet paper got in there. I have no idea. But you remember that. But, you know, like things like canned soup and beans and things that would keep a long time, people start stockpiling. I'm being really excited when I went to Walmart and got the last bag of Great Northern Beans because I'm a Southern guy and I like my white beans and ham. And I took a picture and sent it to Donna saying, Yahoo, you know. But that's just a glimpse of what a famine means. A famine means there's no food to be had. You ever noticed in your life, and maybe you've been fortunate enough to go through this, when you don't live your life like you should in obedience to God, Things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And we're going to see that's what happens to this young man. It's just, you know, about the time the money's gone, then a famine hits. And things are getting worse and worse. And it's going to get, I think, even worse for him than that. He's gone from all the way up here to come crashing down to here. All right. Let's keep seeing what's happening. It's, it's not going to get any better. You think, well, things couldn't get worse. Well, yeah, they can. Uh, 15 through 19. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bred enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So I'll say he's hit rock bottom now. I, I fortunately, have never been in a position in my life, and maybe you have, but you just had to take whatever job you could get because you had to have the money. I've known people who have to do that. Well, he goes to work for a farmer to feed pigs. Now, I don't know if you've ever dealt with pig farming. My dad had a few pigs on his farm, and I had to help sometimes. It's no fun. I mean, pigs are just dirty, smelly animals. You know, they produce bacon and ham and all that good stuff. But if you think about what they look like, you know, pigs can't sweat. So they have to, as I call it in the South, waller in the mud to keep cool. They can even hurt you, I understand. I don't know if you remember in the movie The Wizard of Oz, the work he is before she goes to Oz, is walking along the fence rail, and she falls into the pen. And they're afraid the pig's going to eat her. So, And I had to impress myself. The guy that actually digs her out is named C. And he's the one that becomes the cowardly lion later in Oz. And he's actually scared to death to get her out. When he gets her out, he's shaking. But he had enough courage to go in there and get her. So pigs aren't something you definitely, you know, it's that's a pretty dirty, smelly job. And he was probably a Jew. And pigs were unclean to Jews. So, you know, it's not even as bad as it's going to get yet. Uh, he's to the point where he's hungry. And he would have gladly eaten the pods that the swine ate. And I said, pigs will eat anything, so you tend to just throw all your leftover, we call it slop, in there. And it's nasty looking, and I can't imagine eating it. But I guess if you're hungry enough, you'll eat a lot of things you don't think you'd eat. I'm thinking back in Kings when uh, I think the Assyrians, you know, put a wall around Ahaz and Israel, and they couldn't get any food, and they ate some pretty gross stuff. <laughs> they ate a donkey's head, I think, was one of them, and they were reduced to eating their little kids. You know, that's awful. But, you know, he's looking longingly at these, this stuff the pigs is eating. But it says what? He came to himself. All this experience finally had an influence on him. He finally thought, you know, I had it really good when I had it before. 
And that's that feeling, you know, when I said I couldn't hardly wait to get away. And I lived in Louisville for a year, and I just got more and more miserable, and I didn't like it. And guess where I ended up? I'm back here a year later. I got a job at what was called Mark Marietta back then, and as they say, the rest is history. But, you know, he started looking longingly back home. He thought, you know what? The guys that work for my dad, they have plenty of work. They have it good. I'm just going to go back home. And he starts rehearsing a speech. You know, if I'm going to talk to somebody, and you may do this, you start going over how I'm going to talk to them. Something that's a difficult situation. And he's going to go back to his dad and say, Dad, I'm not even worthy to be your son. But just take me back as a servant, and that'd be great. So that's his plan. He got it all planned out. He's ready to go. So let's see how it turns out. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And his son and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So he's going to head for home. He's got his plan. He knows what he's going to say to his dad when he gets home. So he starts heading for home. But you notice what happens. That dad sees him way off in the distance and he runs to greet him. What's the implication there, you know? He's been looking for him for a while, I think. Every day he's out on that road going, man, I hope my son comes home today. I don't know if he's alive or dead. Notice how he greets him. Runs up, throws his arms around him, right? He's been working with pigs. How do you think he's looking? He's probably dirty and smelly and stinky. You don't see the dad do a couple of things. You don't see the dad start yelling at him. You blew all your inheritance. Where is it? What are you doing back here? Or like probably me would have said, son, if you'd listened and asked your dad's advice, you would have been a lot better off. You know, I've been around the block. I know some things. That's probably what I would have done. He doesn't do any of that. He's just glad his son is back home again. All right. So the son, well, let me get one more thing about, you know, every day he's looking. You know, they didn't have email or texting or phones or even telegraph, you know. Best thing they do is maybe send a letter, and I doubt he even had the money to do that. So he's going to watch for him every day, thinking, well, I don't even know if he's alive or dead. He just kept looking. You remember that first time maybe you sent your child on that school bus? Or maybe you sent him to West Kentucky Youth Camp for the first time, and they're away from you for a week. That first time that kid goes off, and you're like, well, I hope they're okay. Here's the story, and I asked Donna if I could tell this, and she said yes, so even though she's not in here. So she took Jonathan, our oldest son, when he was 16, to get his driver's license. Went down to the courthouse down there in Wycliffe, and I'm working, and I say, will you give me a call? I want to know how he does. So she calls, and she's crying. And I'm like, did he fail? No. Did he have a wreck? No. Well, what happened? What's the matter? Well, he drove me home, and he just got in that car and drove away. And that, you know, because her son just asserted his independence there again, you know. Well, you imagine his daddy, every day he's out there going, man, I hope my son's coming home today. I can't, I can't imagine. All right, let's talk about, again, what does this mean? Who's the father? That's God, right? The son's us, sinners that turn their back on God and, Live any way they want to. You know, that's pleasurable for a while. You know, it says in Hebrews that Moses didn't want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But on some level, a pleasure in sin wouldn't entice us, would it? There's always those consequences. And that's what he saw. You know, he had to hit rock bottom. Sometimes we have to. It'd be better if we didn't have to hit rock bottom. We got a little part of the way there and realize turn around sometimes you have to hit the bottom of the barrel but again greeted open arms you know Charles and I were talking about this the other day 
He just said he had this image of God like this. Come back to me. I'm waiting for you. You know, he takes us back even though we're dirty and covered in sin. We're willing to repent. He'll take us back, you know. We don't have to serve that probationary period, you know. Like the son wanted to be a servant. He started his spiel. The dad stops him, right? Bring the robe. Cover him up. Put the ring on. I think that shows he's part of the family. He probably didn't even have any shoes. They put some shoes on him and killed that fatted calf. You know, they would fatten the calf up for a special occasion. You know, you let a cow run outside and the meat gets tough, right? You put him in a stall and you feed him a good diet, his beast more tender. So he treated that son like royalty. But a lot of times people stop right here. And if you remember a guy named Paul Harvey, there was always this, wasn't it? That's the rest of the story. Now, I did find out, uh, Donald looked at the lesson, look at the prodigal son of Maranon, and they keep going. They don't stop here like we do sometimes. There's more to the parable that's coming up, so let's talk about that. The older brother. Now, the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because... He has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, is lost and is found. So that, you know, that good old older brother, he's out working, right? He sees everybody celebrating. He's like, well, what's going on? He grabs a servant. The servant says, oh, your brother's home. Now, how many of you are the oldest in your family? How many of you think that your younger siblings might have gotten it a little easier than you did? Mm -hmm. Most of us. Now, Jim, you can't say that because you're an only child. <laughs> you're the oldest and youngest. So that might give you a little explanation as to why he does this. It doesn't make it right, though. So the older brother is not happy. You think he'd be thrilled about his brother coming home, but he's angry. And so the father has to leave the celebration and come out and try to get him to come in. And notice his response. You know, I've been many years and I've never disobeyed you. You never even give me a goat or a kid to enjoy with my friends. All right, first off, do you think he's never disobeyed his father? I've never known a kid yet got a child that's never disobeyed you, and that is wonderful. I, I disobeyed my parents. My son's disobeyed me. Donna disobeyed her parents. I've yet to find one. You know, no. Looks like he's jealous, right, of this attention, or he probably wants him to be punished, you know. You, he went out and blew all your money, Dad. What in the world are you celebrating about? You know, notice the phrase he uses, this son of yours. I don't know if you ever had this when you come home. But your wife might say to you, you know what that son of yours did today? It's not our son. It's your son when he's in trouble. And it looks like to me that's what he's doing here. And then he says he wasted it with harlots. Did we read that anywhere? No. Now maybe he did. It wasn't social media to say the youngest son checked in at the Jerusalem house of ill repute or anything. So he doesn't know that. You ever made your point, and I see this on social media all the time, you kind of embellish when you're trying to make a point. These things might sound good. You don't know if they're true, but boy, they sure make your point sound better, don't they? Well, that's what he's doing. He's trying to make his point sound really good. He's having his own little pity party here, you know. Dad, 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 look at all this, look at all this. But, you know, let's see what the dad, you know, let's talk about what the dad said to him. He said... You know, unlike your brother, 
you still got your inheritance, right? And he would have gotten a double portion. He's the oldest son. You could have a goat anytime you want or whatever you have. You didn't have to go through everything your brother went through. You know, all that feeding the pigs, the bottom of the barrel, being all dirty and stinky probably. And But he said, you know, basically, I still love you. You still have all this. But it's appropriate that we should make marry. We should be happy that your brother came home. All right, so we need to, of course, talk about the meaning. Remember at the beginning when those Pharisees and those scribes were like, what are you doing eating? You know, those sinners and publicans. You know, that older brother, that's the Pharisees. And you might look at that and say, yeah, them Pharisees and them scribes, they were terrible people. Can't we do the same thing? I've served this church faithfully all my life. This guy comes forward. And everybody's making a big old deal about it. And nobody ever tells me what good I do. Or, you know, I don't know if I'd trust that guy right off. We better keep an eye on him for a while before we take him back. Well, guess what? If we do that, we're the older brother. So I sometimes think we might be closer to the older brother sometimes than the younger brother in the way we act. And finally, what I think of, and we studied this in... Uh, Galatians, the teenage class, a couple of words ago. Turn to Galatians 6 1, and that's why I'm reading it. Because I thought I only had to go 20 till, but I saw something today. I was supposed to go 15 till, but you guys might get out a minute or two early. So turn to Galatians 6, verse 1. Uh, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted gentleness not anger not wrath not, i told you so not, you're a terrible person but we'll let you back anyway gentleness why considering yourself lest you also be tempted how would you want to be treated if that's you come back i want to be treated with gentleness i want to be treated like that shepherd and that woman and that dad that's why i want to be treated if i should ever fall away and i want to come back I don't want to be treated, you know, like that older brother. And if you even notice at the end of that parable, he says, your brother, not my son, to remind him of their relationship. So anybody got any questions, comments? Uh, next Wednesday, I believe it's Dan Owen, and he's going to talk about Savior. It's one of the words in the Bible for Jesus. So before we dismiss, let's have a word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the parables that we have recorded that Christ spoke and all the wonderful lessons that we find in them. And might we learn from them, Heavenly Father, that we do seek the lost and try to bring them back, and that we bring them in, a, in, a, in an attitude of gentleness and try to get them to come back. But remember, if we do we fall away, that we have to repent, we have to turn away from those things. And, Make sure that we strive to live the life in your service that we should. Thankful again for this BBS that you have blessed it, that much good might come from it. And all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. And I'm not going to lead a song. I'll just tell you straight up. So we're just.